hyoid cavity. Then you'll notice there are two bumps on the front of the humerus. There's one here that's a little bit bigger and more lateral. That's called the greater tubercle. And then there's a smaller one that's more medial called the um, lesser tubercle. And then there is a valley in between the two. And that valley is where the, bice the tendon of your biceps muscle runs, right in there. So that's how you know that you're looking at the anterior or the front surface of the humerus. If you looked at the front of the humerus, see how that looks really different? So I have to flip it like this to make it facing forward. And then I can see the greater tubercle and the lesser tubercle and the tendon of the biceps muscle runs right in here. What did you call the place where the tendon and the biceps are? Uh, it's just a, a rib. It does. It's intertubercular sulcus, but that's not on there. Okay. That's just to help you orient where, which way, which way to face it forward. Okay. Then, if you look at the bottom, the distal end, see how it's kind of rounded down here. So I'm looking at the distal end now of the humerus, and I'll zoom in a little bit. See if that. Right there. See this part that points medial pretty severely right there uh -oh. and then here's a rounded part that is lateral that is going to face it forward now if you look at the back side of the humerus take a look at the difference do you see that huge indent right there on the back side of the humerus so here's the front side that we're looking at and then here's the back side that is called the olecranon fossa. Fossa always means depression, so it means that something called the olecranon process is going to fit in there. And sure enough, that will be your elbow. Okay, so that's how you would know that this is a right humerus, is because this real, um, this large projection points medial, and this fossa is only on the back. And then the other way you know to face it forward is because the head of the humerus is going to fit into the glenoid cavity. Then you find that greater and lesser tubercle, and, and you know that they face forward. So this would be the anterior surface and therefore a right humerus. Now the deltoid tuberosity is the last marking on the humerus to find. This is it facing forward, and then you turn it almost to the back. There's a ridge right here called the deltoid tuberosity. So it's right there. And what muscle do you think attaches there? The deltoid, right. Okay, then when you look at the ulna, I'm going to turn it like this. See if you can see this. See, there is the olecranon fossa. <coughs> and look at how the ulna fits in there. See? That's your elbow. You guys see that? The head of the ulna is like a wrench. So this huge process is called the olecranon process. Now notice that on the front, or the, pro sorry, the proximal end of the radius and ulna, the ulna is bigger, but on the distal end, the ulna is tiny. So look, the ulna is very large at its proximal end and very tiny at its distal end. The radius is the opposite. The radius has a very flat, round head squared off at the top, and then it gets big at the bottom when you get down to the wrist. On the radius, there's a marking called the radial tuberosity that you need to know. You can sort of see it right there. 
that bump, I might be able to zoom in a little bit. And then do you see how the radius can cross over the ulna in order to pronate your hand? That's because of the way that the radius fits into the top surface of the ulna. And then the radial tuberosity is the location where the joint actually occurs, where it's twisting. Okay, so then let's look. Let me show you this way, too. So this is an ulna. Do you see this flat surface right there? That's where the radius fits, right into that. And it twists a little bit. Like this. And that's how you get that pronation effect. Okay, I think I'm ready for the femur. Now, the femur, let's see if I turn around. Oh, one thing else I want to show you, though, here. to show you one more thing about um, the pelvis. See this opening right here is where the baby will come out. So do you see the angle right here? On a male skeleton like this one is, that angle is pretty acute and on a female it would be wider which would give the whole pelvic outlet more room so the baby can be born. This, the tailbone, the coccyx can sometimes stick on the baby and keep the baby from being born. The other thing that can impede the baby's progress are the ischial spines, which on this skeleton are not very big at all, but on some people they actually are pretty big. And in some very traumatic births, if the baby it comes out okay, the mother's ischial spine might actually break off. So it can be, um, a, so if, if someone has a very narrow pelvis, it most likely means that their angle is more acute than uh, typically a woman's would be and they might have more trouble especially if they tend to have bigger babies or something because uh, the cervix can only dilate to about 10 centimeters and even then the baby's skull bones have to fold over each other to make a nice cone head or the baby couldn't get out okay so that's what i 